Welcome to Dampness in Buildings and Diagnosis, Module 1 of 12. We'll start off by having a look to see how we can define damp. Well, we may define it as where there is water in sufficient quantities to cause problems which may be unacceptable, timber decay, staining, decorative spoiling. However, dampness itself is not a health hazard. The consequences, however, of some types of dampness may be, that is, mold growths, dust mites, bacteria, viruses, and other factors. How does water get into a house and where? Well, very common, roof leaks, condensation, plumbing leaks and condensation in the main part of the property, lateral water penetration from high ground levels, flooding, subfloor condensation, rising damp, defective rainwater goods, rainwater penetration from the outer fabric of the building, and indeed all those sources of water are unwanted. Visual evidence of dampness, well there's a whole list and I'm not going to read them all, mold growth being one, timber decay, eruption of finishes, etc, etc. And dampness to finishes. However, let's get down to the nitty gritty. How is water distributed in building materials? First of all, we're going to look at masonry. And by masonry, I'm lumping together here brick, mortar, plaster and so forth. The total moisture content of a material is potentially the sum of two components. The first component is known as the air dry or hygroscopic moisture content. And this is what we would regard as a dry material when there is absolutely no water ingress. It's a material standing level of moisture when in equilibrium with the air. Remember, no water ingress. The second component is known as the capillary or free moisture content. And that is moisture that fills the capillaries of the material. This is the fraction which is only present where there's an active source of water ingress, e.g. rising damp, etc. And it's usually, but not always, this fraction that causes the problems. This is the water that is usually unwanted. And looking at the distribution of moisture in masonry, let's start off by looking at, say, a small piece of brick. That small piece of brick has a pore present in it. So we've magnified it enormously. This small piece of brick has been in an oven and it's been dried out, completely dried out, absolutely as dry as a bone. The minute we take it out of the oven and suspend it in air, water is simply absorbed from the air. And this is where we get our hygroscopic or air dry moisture from. And that is how it will stay. It will vary slightly depending on the humidity. However, if we then come along and start pouring water over our piece of brick, then the pores start filling with water and this is where we get our capillary moisture from, capillary or free moisture. As long as we keep pouring water over our piece of brick, we will maintain capillary moisture. However, if we stop it, suspended in air, then it will simply evaporate and we come back to our standing hygroscopic moisture, our air dry moisture content. And that's where we hopefully find a dry material. However, the only way we will maintain a truly dry material is to put it in an oven and heat it. And that's where we will get back to our purely dry material. Hygroscopicity of air dry materials, examples of uncontaminated masonry. Well, let's have a look. That's just some examples. We've used here an air dry moisture content measured at 75% relative humidity. Gypsum plaster 0.4, red brick 0.3, cement render 1.3. It's usually higher if it's not carbonated, lime plaster 1.5. They're not fixed. They will vary. They will vary. It does depend on the material. Indeed, some lightweight renovating plasters are up to about 6%. These are clean air dry materials. However, as we'll see later, if we contaminate those materials with certain salts, hygroscopic deliquescent salts, then our air dry 
moisture contents, even at 75%, can increase massively, sometimes making the material actually look visibly damp. But as I've said, we'll look at this again later. And this just illustrates what happens with an increase in relative humidity. It increases the air dry moisture content. How much it's going to increase, it depends on the particular material. What do we therefore mean by the term saturation? Because we're looking at moisture content. We say a material is saturated. Well, let's have a look at this. This is a material. The black lines are the pores in the material. This is both porous and permeable. The material, in this case, is saturated at a total moisture content of 16%. It has moderate porosity and permeability. However, this material has limited porosity and permeability. That is saturated at 5% moisture content. All the pores are full of water. It can't take, neither of those can take in any more liquid. Yet they are, in many respects, equally as wet. They are both saturated. And taking this a little bit further, let's imagine this is a brick embedded in mortar and it's been raining for 40 days and 40 nights and water's been running down the wall. The brick is saturated at 10%, the mortar has become saturated at 16%. The minute we stop the water, we fix the water leak, things are going to start to dry out. And we would get to a hypothetical situation where the brick is half saturated at 5% and the mortar half saturated at 8%. Where we're going with this is that it is an error to try and compare the total moisture contents of two totally different materials. They will have almost certainly different moisture carrying capacities, different saturation values. One common error is as illustrated here. Somebody's measured the plaster and find it's got 7% and then they've taken a sample of the brick and find it's only got 4% and they conclude that the problem isn't dampness in the wall really, it's due to something like condensation because the plaster is wetter than the brick. One cannot make that direct comparison very, very easily at all. So we've looked at the distribution of water in building materials, that's masonry, let's have a look at wood. There we go, the equilibrium moisture content of wood. The important feature to remember about wood is that it is a hygroscopic material. It absorbs moisture from the atmosphere. Its air dry moisture content depends on the surrounding humidity. And there are a couple of examples. Say in our example there, wood kept at 80% RH has a moisture content, air dry moisture content of around 18, probably 19%, probably a bit more in some cases. However, if we drop the relative humidity down to around about 45%, then our wood will come out with a moisture content, an air dry moisture content of 10 to 11%. Wood is a hygroscopic material. And this is just a more complicated version of the same table, um, more accurate, clearly. But it does show that there is a temperature factor. And we do get very high humidities as standard in colder months of the year in cellars, subfloor areas and roofs. So then, how is water distributed in wood? Well, if we imagine wood being made up of little boxes and tubes of, say, cellulose, the first thing that happens is that the cell wall takes up water first. And a cell wall becomes saturated at figures around 28 to 30 percent moisture content. When the cell wall is saturated, it is said to be at its fibre saturation point. And indeed, on some of the older moisture meters, as we'll see later, this is marked. However, if there is an excessive source of water, then water starts to fill the boxes and the tubes itself. It starts to fill the lumen. And this is where we get moisture contents in excess of 28 to 30%.
this is where the wood now starts to become wet and it's really at this stage it comes excessively vulnerable to the development initiation and development of fungal decay end of module one